Hey everybody, I wanted to jump in at the top of the episode here with a quick note. After we got done chatting, Fiona and I realized that both Ardar and PCBFA will be at the Foster's Ag Trade Show here this weekend, March 9th, 10th, and 11th. So if you've got more questions about off-calf, you can definitely swing by Ardar's booth and ask them in person in Grand Prairie. Uh, You can also swing by and see PCBFA's booth. And if you're listening to this after that has come and gone... You can still come see us at the Sarda Egg Trade Show, March 16th, 17th, and 18th. I don't think Ardar will be there, but PCBFA will, and so will the Peace Region Living Lab. And while I'm plugging PCBFA's events, we've also got a forest grazing school coming up March 15th. Again, we'll be discussing how to get the most out of your forested pasture, as well as how to apply some of these principles that are usually applied on rangeland or tame pasture, and how that might apply to your forests. But... That's all I have for now, so thank you very much for tuning in, and enjoy the episode. Coffee, Cows, and Crops is produced by the Peace Country Beef and Forage Association and hosted by Extension Coordinator Johanna Murray. On this podcast, we discuss management practices and research results with scientists, ranchers, researchers, and farmers. We strive to share innovative information and farming practices supported by sound science and practical wisdom. So grab a cup of coffee and let's get learning. Hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode of Coffee, Cows, and Crops. Uh, Today, I'm chatting with Fiona Bryady from Results Driven Agriculture Research about the On-Farm Climate Action Fund program, uh, how producers can apply, what's eligible under this program, and all that fun stuff. But before we get into that, Fiona, can you introduce yourself and tell me a little bit about what OFCAF is? Sure. Thank you so much for having me today. Uh, As mentioned, I'm Fiona, and I'm the OFCAF On-Farm Climate Action Fund program manager for Ardar. OFCAF is a federal funded program through Agriculture Canada, and it's a greenhouse gas reduction program. So the On-Farm Climate Action Fund is pretty exciting because there's lots of money available, and uh, some cool stuff you can do under the program. So what are the funders hoping to achieve through this program? So there's a couple of things, like I mentioned, it's a greenhouse gas reduction program, really. Um, But really, the main target of the program is to uh, fund farmers to adopt BMPs on their farm. And the goal is to decrease greenhouse gas emissions, increase the sustainability, efficiency, and resiliency of on-farm operations. And for us, we have three categories of funding, nitrogen management, cover cropping, and rotational grazing. Awesome. So I guess the first question is, uh, what do you need to apply to this program? Well, the good thing about this program is we really don't have a lot of strings attached in terms of entrance and how you get to be eligible. So you need to have $25,000 of farm income and you have to be an active producer in Alberta. And that's gross farm income, right? That's right. Yep. Awesome. And it has a pretty significant cost share. So how much funding is available to producers and uh, what's what's the cost share rate on this program? Yeah, I've been delivering programs for a long time, and this has an awesome uh, cost ratio. So produce each farm is eligible up to $75,000. That's for the life of the program. And we have a cost share of 85%. Right on. So like you mentioned, there are three streams of kind of best management practices that you're uh, looking to fund through this program. And each one has got some slightly different rules. So can you give me a quick overview of what each stream kind of covers? Sure. So for nitrogen management, uh, we kind of have three main activities under this. Uh, The first one is really the soils one, and that's one that was really, we had huge uptake last fall. So soils uh, testing and soil mapping for variable rate is is a big one there. We then look at a couple of um, fertilizer um, activities. So that includes dual inhibitors. I have to stress it must be dual inhibitors. And ESN, we have a limit of 4,800 per farm for ESN. And then we also support banding or side dressing in our program. Mm -hmm. And then we have two other activities under this. One is what we call amendments. So that is for transportation and spreading of manure or compost. 
And then we also, uh, this one gets lost, so I really like to highlight it, but we also look at seeding of perennials for hay. Um, the caveat there is that it has to be 50% legume. So people miss this one because it's the only kind of forage one and it's under nitrogen management. Um, everything else forage related is really kind of under cover crops or rotational grazing. So I like to highlight that one just to make sure it was uh, it's noticed. For sure. And then what's under cover cropping? So cover crop, we really cover two things there, the seed costs and custom seeding. We haven't mentioned it yet, but we don't do any in-kind in our program. It all has to be either rental of equipment or custom done. Um, so we don't support any in-kind. So if you either rent a, you know, a brilliant seeder or anything like that, um, we'll pay for that or have someone custom do it. And then we also pay for the seed cost for cover crops. Cool. And uh, what's, you have some rules around uh, standing forage at the end of the year with cover crops. Is that right? That's right. Uh, thanks for bringing that up. So we have to have six inch of standing growth uh, going into winter under the cover crop. So you can graze it, but you must leave that six inches of growth going into cover crops. And two other things I should mention, I guess, under cover crops um, is that if you're going to do a silage crop, that's not eligible because we're really looking to have that cover and a live root going into winter. And then also swath grazing is not something we cover as well. So if you're going to use it for forage, you guys either want it silaged early so it can grow back or uh, you want us to graze it through the winter. Yeah, I think we really want you to actually apply a uh, seed a crop after you take the silage crop off or have it under seeded under your silage crop so that it would regrow for sure. And then, yeah, we're looking for that live root, leave something living. Uh, we're looking to increase soil health and reduce erosion going into winter. So really this was, uh, I think, developed more for the specialty crop um, cropping side of things. But in Alberta, it fits for the livestock side as well. And so we kind of make it fit for that as well. But it is used a lot in Southern Alberta for specialty crops like beans and potatoes as well. That makes sense. We're just biased up in the peace country because we use those cocktails for so much silage up here. You're right, yep. And we try to make it work, you know, it, it's hard to describe what works across from one end of the province to the other. They're so different and every farm is different. So I guess that would be a message I would send to anyone who's listening who might think they don't fit in this is don't make that judgment. If you're unsure based on the information we have, give us a call um, and we'll talk you through your farm specifically because it's very hard to kind of generalize every farm and every region in Alberta and what fits and doesn't fit in our program. And I guess the last one is that grazing management program. Yeah, grazing management. This one has been actually really, really popular as well. We've actually uh, approved more money on this than any other category. Um, and so that's an interesting uh, tidbit for people. Um, so it, what we pay for here is we don't pay for perimeter fencing, but anything internal. So any internal fences that could be electric or barbed wire, and it can be temporary or permanent as well. And then we pay for water distribution. So we don't pay to dig dugouts or drill wells, but any distribution. So we pay when we have a shallow buried pipeline that's eligible, uh, remote watering systems, anything like that in terms of the water development and distribution are eligible activities. And under this one too, we pay for forage sampling. So if you're extending that grazing season, want to be sure what you're feeding, we will pay for the forage sampling as part of that as well. Interesting. I hadn't heard about the forage sampling. That's cool. Yeah. So it sounds like it's, it's practices only. No infrastructure gets paid for. Well, I guess fencing is infrastructure and some in remote watering systems, <laughs> but definitely no capital items. Um, mm. We just don't make any capital purchase in terms of equipment um, in our program at this time. That makes sense. Oh, I should also ask um, pasture rejuvenation, which I know you were talking about seeding new hay stands and that sort of stuff, but is there any limits, I guess, on uh, seeding legumes pasture rejuvenation, that sort of stuff. 
Yeah, that's good. I missed that actually in rotational grazing. Yes, pasture rejuvenation is an eligible item under rotational grazing. Again, it has to be the 50% legume um, that you're getting to. And so we will evaluate that and it, we don't have any cost limits on that. So again, we'll look at the cost of seed and the seeding uh, for pasture rejuvenation if it's 50% legume or more. Okay. So I guess the next question is, how are you evaluating these programs or projects? Can you tell me a little bit more about the evaluation process? Sure. So f first things, uh, you know, people have to uh, sub submit a template, which we have online for each of those activities. That's a one pager that really tells us what the land locations are, what the practice they're doing and the cost of it. And then with, they also must submit an air photo. And so our process really is look at the project, one, make sure they, you know, meet the requirements. So the $25,000 income. Having said that, we will also look at beginner farmers, which we should talk about later too. Um, so we really just look at the, do they meet the requirements? And then we pull up the information on the template, the application and the air photos. So we'll look at how many acres, um, if we go through a scenario of soil sampling, so we pull up the air photo and verify how many acres are on that field. If it is, uh, you know, a crop field um, and, and what else might be there then we make sure that they haven't said this is a routine practice. Our practices must be either new to the field or new to the farm. And so for soil sampling, that doesn't mean you, you uh, have a never soil sampled. We will actually look at increasing the depth or the number of samples per field. So we will do zero to 24 inches and then increasing frequency in the field. So, um, Again, new to the field, new to the farm just means um, different. I guess it doesn't mean you can't, you have never done that practice before. Um, so we look at that, evaluate the acres. Uh, we have the cost guide we use. So it's $300 a field for soil sampling and it's $8 an acre for soil mapping. And so we calculate all that out, make sure we've included uh, if the professional agrologist or CCA has put a cost in there, make that sure that meets the requirements and then um, do the approvals based on kind of the rates we have set before everybody and then they're approved. So it's a first come first serve basis. So as long as you're doing things that are eligible and you meet the requirements, um, yeah, we, we don't make decisions on in or out based on the farm. As long as it's eligible, we have the funds, they are approved and then, um, we just send them that notice and tell them when they need to get a report to us. So it's uh, fairly comprehensive on our side because we do go through all the air photos and make sure it makes sense. And then if people are putting, you know, if you go to the other side of rotational grazing, we need to know where the existing fences are. Is there a perimeter fence and where is their water? And what are they using for water development? So we just make sure the project has some context, makes sense for what we're doing. And again, it's it, it fits our eligible items. Right, that makes sense. So you mentioned the, the financials very briefly there, but part of that uh, one pager that you download is it's got a little bit of a, of a budget there and you want quotes and stuff for that sort of thing, right? No, we don't require quotes. So we we use um, actually Saskatchewan's custom rate guide for most of the activities. So their set kind of rates makes it clear for everybody. Um, but I do recommend if you're going to put in a water system or anything that's sort of customized to what you need that you do get a quote because they can vary so much in price uh, depending on the lift, the number of cows, all those sorts of things. So if you just take a generic kind of pricing, you know, you might have under under um, estimated what your costs are, and that will be a problem for us. So we, once you have that approval, we don't increase it. That's your approval and your cap. Um, but it's obviously not a problem if you come under that budget. But if you've underestimated some of those costs that aren't a standard cost for us, then we don't increase that budget. It's just um very hard to manage these number of applications we have. So we kind of, once you're in and approved, we kind of move on to the next one. Um, 
the first application round, we had over 700 applications. So it's a lot to get through. And so we try to be done with the project once we're finished with it. Makes sense. Uh, and what is required for tracking after they're approved? What sort of stuff do we have to submit for proof of purchase, I guess? Yeah, that's a great question. And one we're seeing lots of uh, as we get through these payments this year. So we need proof of payment to fill our reimbursement. So not just an invoice that says paid, but we need either a canceled check, proof of e-transfer, something like that. So we need to know it was actually paid and you need to prove to us that it was paid. So we need a proof of payment. We need some business information. Obviously we issue an AGR1 tax receipt. So we'll need that business, uh, either a business number or a social insurance number, depending on your arrangement there. And then we'll need some banking information because we do not do any checks. We just e-transfer everything. So we will send out a list. It's on our website of what we require, but that's really the basics of it with some pictures of your project, especially this year. Now, you know, you're approved at beforehand. So we'd like to see some pictures of the actual project and what it looks like. And so that will um, go a long ways for us to you know, demonstrate to Ag Canada and auditors that the project was done. And you'll see we asked for a geo-reference picture or a state stamped one. We get lots of questions on that. So I should mention, if you just take a picture with your phone and you haven't taken the location off, um, it will be already geo-referenced. So unless you've turned that locator off on your phone, uh, just a picture with your phone suffices for us as well. So I guess the next question is, once your project gets approved, uh, when can you start making purchases and how long do you have to get the work done? So for 2023, uh, we're saying nothing before April 1st. So if you're approved before that, April 1st is your first time you can uh, purchase items and you have till January 2024 to finish your project and get the invoices and your project completion report to us. Okay. I should mention the reason we have that pre-approval for 2023 is because we don't want people to go out and spend 75,000 assuming they're gonna get reimbursed and find out we're out of funds. So that's really not, uh, not us other than we don't wanna build expectations, put people spend money they maybe don't plan to spend uh, without being reimbursed. And so we don't wanna pe put people in those positions and Quite frankly, I don't want to get the phone call saying I purchased this assuming I was going to get paid and now I'm not going to get paid. So um, that's the reason for the pre-approval. People ask us a lot about that. It's really a risk management piece, both on our parts and the producer part. So they know exactly what funds they're going to get for the year. Makes sense to me. I guess the next question with that, uh, you mentioned the PAG approval very briefly earlier. So can you talk a little bit about the PAG side of things and how people can get help with their applications? For sure. So uh, I mentioned these one page templates. You'll see that in our web page and our program there. That needs to be submitted as part of the project. At the bottom of those templates, you'll have a there's a place where you must put a PAG, professional agrologist or certified crop advisor. We need the name, the date they've looked at it and if they are a PAG or CCA. It's part of the requirements for this program across Canada. Um, some organizations who deliver this program do it internally, behind the scenes with a group of people, but we put it out front so that um, you can work with a professional agrologist or certified crop advisor just to help make sure you're doing things like making the right choice of seed varieties, other things for your region that make sense for your operation. So kind of reduce the risk. Most of these are new BMPs to people. They're trying things. Um, that's why the large cost share to reduce that risk. So this step in terms of a PAG or CCA really helps reduce that risk in terms of the agronomics, the regional, uh, you know, what makes sense for each region and your farm and how you're going to have the most success out of it. So they can charge you for that assistance. They can help you with that air photo or any of the information on your application. Um, and we will reimburse that cost 10% of the total eligible cost. We have a cap on that up to $2,000. 
And the reason we have a cap on that again is we want the dollars to go to implementation, not for the pre-work before you actually apply. That makes sense. I know uh, PCBFA has a couple of uh, professional urologists on staff and we can help put some of those plans together or we can connect you with some other local PAGs if you're in the Peace region. So Perfect. Yeah, there's a lot to help, I think, up in the Peace. We've had tons of applications actually from Peace, Grand Prairie, all that region, and it's great to see. So there's lots of support up there. And yeah, certainly talk to Peace Country Beef or, um, you know, other people if you guys are too busy, but lots of help out there. And I would just suggest if anyone's struggling, please don't. There's lots of people to help you, whether that's with the actual template and the information or if it's with the technology of applying online, um, because that can be a barrier for some people. And so please don't let that be a barrier. If you guys can't find anybody in Peace Country to help, we'll help find someone on our side to help you with the online process as well, because uh, we don't want any of those things to be a barrier for people to apply for funds. Right on. Beginner farmers, I guess, is the other question we should talk about a little bit. So if they, I'm guessing you're classifying that as somebody who doesn't have any, doesn't have any farm income yet. I think it's really the ones who don't make that 25000 Um, And so it is a requirement of the program, but we will look at uh, beginner farmers. We still need a business plan or some information from them in terms of what stage are they at. I would say if you haven't started farming or haven't, you don't own anything or haven't started, this program still is not for you. But if you're getting there and you're not quite at that 25,000 income, you might be this year or next year, please apply, flag it as a new farm and we'll evaluate that based on the information you have. I think with this 85% cost share and 75,000, what a huge opportunity it is for new farmers. I, I am a first generation farmer. I understand those struggles and this would have made a huge difference in those first few years. So um, please do reach out to us, uh, apply anyways, flag it as a new farm and we'll follow up with conversations and help to see if we can make that work. I'm not promising everyone will get approved because of it, but if you can show you're almost there and you have a business plan to get there in the next while, which we will certainly evaluate that. Fantastic. That sounds good. I'm just trying to look and see if there's anything else really keen. Uh, we net mentioned that manure management is part of that uh, nitrogen management as well. I know there have been a couple of people been pretty excited about that. I think we have moved more manure in the last year than has been moved in 10 years. We have had a ton <laughs> of applications for manure to get hauled out. And that's great because it's totally the goal of the program is to get manure on land that hasn't had it for 10 years. The reason we have the $75 an acre is really to help with those transportation costs. As we know, and I am a cow-calf producer, um, you put it on the land that's closest, that's the cheapest to go to, and the ones that farther away you just don't get out there as much because of cost. So this $75 an acre is really meant to help with the assistance of those costs, not to actually pay for the um, you know, manure, manure itself, but to help with that, that barrier of the transportation to farther away land. So people have really taken us up on that. We have had a lot, a lot of applications on manure. Excellent. All righty. Well, is there anything else that we've missed that you'd like to touch on before we wrap up here? Um, no, I think, again, I would just say, if you have any questions, um, your first step would be the program guide. Look for that on our webpage. That really kind of contains everything in terms of what's eligible, what's not. Uh, but if you're still not sure, you should reach out to us um, or any of the support people like Peace Country Beef or other people to ask the questions. Don't cut yourself out of this program just by what you read. I would say pick up the phone and make a phone call first. Um, we do have a 1877 number I can give out. So it's one 503 five nine five five and um you can email us at offcalf.bmp at rdar.ca um so reach out to us anytime um reach out to the network around you there's lots of people up in the piece who are helping with this program 
and just make sure you're not eligible. Cause I, I like to think there's something for everybody in this program, but um, you know, that's not always the case, but I would say it's worth the conversation for sure. Definitely. And if you're not a, if you're not an Alberta producer, but you've made it this far on the podcast, uh, this is a fend- federal grant. So check out uh, your local, your local uh, ag people in BC or Saskatchewan or Manitoba, and they might be able to find you some off-calf money too. That's right. And on that note, I would also just like to, I always like to make sure people know that we're not the only ones delivering this funding in Alberta. Canadian Forage and Grasslands Associations does the rotational grazing as well. And then EcoCert does organic uh, producers as well as Canadian Canola Council in terms of canola crops. So there are a few options. Each each program's a little bit different. So I would encourage you to find one that works for you. Um, for us, it's a success if all those programs are out of money because that means Alberta farmers have accessed all the money they can. So um, yeah, I just like to mention those because it's, uh, as I said, there's different programs and some might meet other people's needs more than our program does. Right on. Oh, and on that note, I guess, I was going to ask you how much funding is allocated for this year for RDAR and how close is your program to being fully subscribed for 2023? So not to be cagey about this one, but uh, we're still working with Ag Canada to finalize some of those numbers only because there is uh, some funding that needs to be rolled from the first year of the program, which actually didn't happen anywhere in the country. So um, I'm confident to say the same amount of money as last year. Um, we allocated over $12 million last year, approved it for projects in Alberta. So we have at least that much. We have a little bit more coming and we'll certainly be transparent about what that total is once we have it. Uh, but I don't want to make promises because there's nothing um, written in stone in terms of what that final dollar amount is. Uh, but at least $12 million and uh, potentially more for 2023. We opened in January, mid-January for applications. We've received over 300 applications so far. Um, so we still have funds available, but um, you know, if you base it on last year, we funded 640 applications. And so uh, I would always encourage people to apply as soon as possible. Uh, it is a first come first serve uh, program. And so, you know, it's hard for us to predict when we'll we'll be out of funds or when we won't be, but that's kind of where we stand right now. So I would encourage anyone who's thinking about it uh, to make an application, even if it's for fall uh, work, because you need to apply now to do those things. Makes sense to me. Right on. Well, thank you very much, Fiona. I will uh, put the link to Ardar's website down in the description, and I'll drop that uh number as well and of course if people have questions they can get a hold of you there or they can get a hold of pcbfa and we'll do our best to help them out sounds great thank you so much for making the time for me to share this program with people and uh i got giving the opportunity for them to hear more about this any avenue we can get to make sure everybody is aware of the program is most appreciated so thank you for making the time and inviting us today my pleasure Peace Country Beef and Forage Association is a research and extension group based out of Fairview, Alberta. Our mission is to help producers thrive in an agricultural system that is profitable, regenerative, and attractive to future generations. To learn more about what we do and see the results of our research trials or our archive of newsletters and fact sheets, check out our website at peacecountrybeef.ca. Want to get in touch? Have a burning question or a topic suggestion? Send us a message on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. Thanks for listening. Thank you.